Good evening and thank you for coming. This is the uh, second State of the City address that I have been able to deliver as Mayor of the City of Marysville. It is a distinct pleasure to do so. I'd like to uh, also thank all of our council members for being here this evening. We have Council Member Buggy, Council Member Hendricks, Council Member Pyden, Mayor Pro Tem Dunn, Council Member Barber, Council Member Wessel, as well as all of our um, administrative staff is here, our city manager and all of our department heads. Also thank Commissioner Bohm for attending this evening. I found it important to deliver a State of the City address because, as you're all aware, business is conducted in these council chambers via city council meetings 24 times a year. Those 24 times a year is when we're actually voting on issues, where we're voting to approve a budget, voting to expend taxpayer dollars uh, in some fashion that we believe to be a benefit to this community. Aside from the 24 sessions we have in City Council Chambers, we also have goal-setting sessions held upstairs. We also have our budget sessions where we determine what our revenue is and how that revenue shall be allocated again for the betterment of the city. State of the City allows a synopsis of uh, how all of those meetings have fit together over the course of the past calendar year. We don't do this by a fiscal year, we do it by a calendar year. So. Without any further ado, we'll get started. Our mission is very simple. Mayor, council, and all city employees are committed to providing exemplary services by responding to the needs of our residents and businesses in a pleasant, timely, and fiscally responsible manner. Taking a look at really the question that is often asked is our budget. Our total budget this year for fiscal year beginning 2015 going into 2016, the total budget, all funds, was $20,898,000. Sewer comprised 13%. The general fund law enforcement comprised 39%. Major and local streets rounded off the vast majority of the rest of that at 12%. Our general fund budget in and of itself was $8,221,000. The vast majority of that, being 37%, was public safety, followed by public works at 20%, general government at 13 transfers at 15%, pension benefits at 11%, and then smaller portions made up of what you can see in the slide. Taking a look at our revenues, these are what we'd call the, the hard numbers. Property taxes, $6.6 million. Licensing and permits was $275,000. Intergovernmental revenue was a little over $1 million. Interest and in rents, about $128,000. Our expenditures equal that out at $8,221,000. That's the, the total amount of our revenue as well. Again, public safety comprises a little over $3 million of that. General government, a little over $1 million. And public works, about one6 Pension, we did have to allocate $930,000 this year. The city operates at 16.11 mills. This millage rate has not increased since 2006. I think it's also very fair to state that you have a council committed to ensuring that that count that that millage rate does not increase. Now, last year we were advised that we should raise our water rates. Last year we had decided not to raise our water rates because we found that we had made promises to the taxpayers of the city of Marysville not to raise taxes in any fashion. We found that water rates were one of those rates that could be reasonably inferred as a tax, although it's technically not. But we still took a look at uh, the funds that come out of our taxpayers' wallets. So we did not raise water rates last year. Water rates did have to be raised in this fiscal year. S what you will see though is that there was a cut to our refuse rate by 50 percent. There was a refuse tax put on by uh, a few councils, well it was a tax put on by a council years ago. 
something that in our last budget session, this council felt very strongly about lowering both the administrative tax and the rescue, the refuse tax, I'm sorry, the refuse rate. We were able to carve off 50% of that this year. Water and sewer rates, like I indicated, they did have to go up this year, 3.4%. The overall change, though, when you're talking about water rates, refuse rates, the overall change was an annual savings of 2.5% or $17.48 per household. One way to get a pulse on where your community is going is to take a look at the property values from year to year, your taxable values. If we back up when we look at 2013, your taxable value for real commercial property was 42,615,000. In 2014, that dropped to 38,377,000, which was an 11% decrease from 2013. Moving across from 2014 to 2015, we're starting to see a slight increase. And I think that it's fair to state that we had indicated that we had hoped that the commercial market and residential markets had, had bottomed out by way of taxable value and we we're going to start to see a slight increase. And that's actually exactly what we did see. With real industrial from 2013 to 2014, there was a 7% decrease, falling to 30 million from little, from falling to 30 million 710,000 from 32 million 858,000. From 2014 to 2015, we saw a slight increase, 30 million 710,000 to a little over uh, 30 million 800,000, a 0.3% increase. An increase is an increase, however slight it may be. What this is, is this is a positive sign. For real residential, there was again a 0.6% decrease from 2013 to 2014. However, our 2014 uh, taxable value for real residential was $193,087,000. That went up by 1.9% in 2015 to $196,928,000. Overall, when you take a look at the aggregate from 2014 to 2015, you have a 1.5% increase when you combine real commercial, real industrial, and real residential as compared to a 2.9% decrease from the previous year. Personal property tax, the, I'm sorry, the personal property taxable value, uh, there was a 4% increase between 2013 and 2014, and a 6.9% increase between 2014 and 2015. Overall, when you take a look at the total amount of real property and personal property, we went from a 0.9%, I'm sorry, 0.94% decrease from 13 to 14, so just under 1%, to a 3.1% increase this past fiscal year. So again, looking at maybe just a bit of the pulse of where real property is going in the city of Marysville, each one of, each one of these was an increase as compared to a decrease from the previous year. Getting into some of our departments specifically, our wastewater treatment plant and our department head, Barry Rubel, is here this evening. A wastewater treatment plant won four regional and state awards for recent improvements. Project of the Year Award from American Public Works Association from the Metro Detroit branch. Project of the Year Award from American Public Works Association, the Michigan Chapter. Outstanding Civil Engineering Project of the Year from American Society of Civil Engineers, Southeast Michigan Section. And Outstanding Civil Engineering Project of the Year, the American Society of Civil Engineers, Michigan Section. So I'd like to congratulate Mr. Rubel and all of his staff on running the wastewater and water treatment plants. Earlier this year, we had Congresswoman Candace Miller. She toured the facility um, because of what we have is the real-time monitoring. And this is monitoring, uh, essentially, water from Lake Huron to Lake Erie. And it is essentially a uh, safety network. And this would measure uh, if there was a spill or if there were contaminants in the water. Uh, this uh, real-time monitoring, this is something that Congresswoman Miller was very intrigued about and really gave kudos to the city for being not only a part of, but as you can see, 
the chair of that network is Barry Rubel. And this is really water protection all up and down the St. Clair River and beyond. As it relates to some of the infrastructure in the city, we repainted the 14th Tower, 14th Street Tower and installed a new mixer unit to prevent freeze-ups during the winter. That is, that's actually a, 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 a mixer inside that unit to keep the water in that tower from freezing. Mr. Rubel suggested that we do one to see how it goes. So that was affixed to the 14th Street Tower. The feedback on that is that it, they had absolutely no problems with it. It's been extraordinarily productive. There was no ice and uh, just, I believe it was last week, we approved a second mixer uh, for this fiscal year and Mr. Rubel, I'm sure, will be coming back to us next fiscal year to ask for the third tower to have uh, the mixer put into it. And there's a picture of uh, Congresswoman Candace Miller and, um, and Mr. Rubel at, at our wastewater treatment plant. I'm sorry, at our water treatment plant. One of the other things we did uh, this past fiscal year, I'm sorry, this, this past calendar year, so we completed the North End pumping station. And really what this is, is if you've driven by um, Ravenswood and M29 Gratiot in the area just south of the Speedway gas station, you saw a lot of construction there. What that construction ended up being is what we're, what is referred to as the North End Pumping Station. This is uh, essentially a lift that allows us to take all of the wastewater from all of those residences and businesses uh, that were uh, north of where we could uh, bring the water back to our wastewater treatment plant and, and now with this lift station, now we can do that. What we had to do before is we had to send all this wastewater to Port Huron and we paid a fee for that. With the way Port Huron's water rates are going up, we found that it would be more economically advantageous. We were advised again by Mr. Rubel uh, that over the long haul, what we'll see is a savings. What this also did, however, is it made us completely independent. Um, Marysville's uh, wastewater treatment is now completely independent. We treat all of our own wastewater. We are no longer sending any water to any other jurisdiction. We are completely self-sufficient. The return on the investment for the North End pumping station is expected to be eight years. Now, I would indicate that it's expected to be eight years uh, assuming that water rates don't go up in the city of Port Huron any further than they already have. Assuming those water rates continue to rise, uh, that would be a shorter rate of return on that. Um, again, uh, upgrades uh, to the wastewater plant resulted in an efficiency and annual cost savings of about $15,000. And again, that is just a picture of the North End pumping station. The Department of Public Works, one of the things that the Department of Public Works I think has been good at historically, but what they've really gotten into in the last couple of years is their community involvement. Um, what this is, this is a picture of um, the DPW along with volunteers from across the city. You can see, uh, I believe it's a member of our Lions Club, I don't know who exactly who that is, but members of our DPW, members of our city council, uh, I believe there's Council Member Wessel mixed in in there, our department head Barry Kreiner. Um, and these were volunteers that came and they cleaned up, picked uh, weeds out of the boardwalk area and really cleaned up that area. Um, maintaining the living shoreline, these are the rain gardens. So all along our river road across from the golf course, volunteers went out. And this is, again, what we're talking, a private and public uh, collaboration. This is the public sector and the private sector working together for the betterment of our community. The No Shave November. Um, if you saw all of our uh, DPW workers looking a little bit rough and gruff, it was because they were raising money for the uh, SOS Food Pantry. It's a Marysville-based, charitable needs-based organization that donates food to families in need. Um, our DPW, on their own accord, raised uh, funds and contributed more than 2,000 pounds of food to the SOS Food Pantry. I think it's an extraordinary effort and uh, something that they really need to be commended for. This was all on them. There was no direction uh, by city administration other than uh, Mr. Rubel, who is the head of, that D the, head of the DPW. Often there is discussion about the infrastructure. And if you've watched the news, if you've read the newspaper, 
anything involving municipalities or townships, the topic of discussion is how are we going to fix our roads, what funds are we going to use. Uh, we have been able to spend approximately $1.8 million in road repairs in the city of Marysville this year. And that is uh, capital improvement, as you can see uh, depicted in this slide. That is not the tarring of the roads or the filling of the cracks or the standard maintenance that you see that goes on every day throughout the course of the city. This is actual capital improvement. There were four roads that were done. Delaware, which is obviously right out front of us here, St. Lawrence and Lidwood, Virginia, 8th Street, Indiana, New Hampshire, and Vermont. Um, some of those, I think, are still underway a little bit, but at the end of the day, uh, Marysville, without going to the voters for a millage, without asking the voters for a millage, uh, with the funds that we have been able to put away for roads, was able to spend $1.8 million uh, to better our infrastructure for the sake of our residents. And I think you really have to commend uh, in, in this, you have to commend some prior councils who were able to uh, have the foresight to start putting this money away. But you also really have to commend the Department of Public Works because what we have been able to do, you know, in 2008 when things really started to get bad economically, changes had to be made. And it isn't just in the city of Marysville or the city of St. Clair or the county of St. Clair or the state of Michigan. It really was nationwide. Uh, governments of all sizes had to really reassess and reassemble the way they did things. Now, I wasn't on council at that point, but I can tell you for the last four years, what we have been able to do is we have been able to tighten the purse strings on the spending. But what you're seeing now is collaboration among uh, different departments. You're seeing the DPW and the water department work together. You're seeing the, the DPW do projects at the golf course and for the betterment of the golf course. You're seeing uh, the DPW actually get involved with and work on some of these roads so that the, uh, the cost of the repair of these roads and the cost to maintain our infrastructure is less every year. I don't know that that's anything that was done in years past, but I can tell you that uh, our department heads, every single one of them, has sharpened their pencils and found a way to uh, ensure that every dollar and every dime that we're spending of the taxpayers' money is being allocated in the best way possible and to lighten that load uh, they have, the DPW and other, other departments have become involved in these projects so as to, again, uh, have, um, have the cost of that in actual dollars and cents be less. One of the things that Mr. Kreiner came to this council on that I will indicate that I was extreme, extremely apprehensive about was this liquid road uh, that was done in the uh, Emerald Forest subdivision. Mr. Kreiner uh, approached the council during a um, city council meeting and had come across this product for roads that, um, that are really are in, in, in the shape of um, the Emerald Forest subdivision. Roads that don't have a lot of heavy truck traffic, roads that don't have a lot of stop and go, roads that are basically um, residential carrier driven and uh, it indicated that uh, he thought that we could save a lot of money and save our roads by applying this liquid road. We had a I think fairly comprehensive discussion about it by the end of the discussion. Uh, I was uh, sold that I thought it to be a good idea and this has actually gone through and most of that Emerald Forest subdivision has been coated uh, with this liquid road. This was primarily used in parking lots before, but again, you know, to point out, this is the kind of outside-the-box thinking that is taking place in every department in the city of Marysville right now. Um, it would be easy just to do joint sealing, like is shown in the picture on the bottom right, on those roads, and uh, because that's the standard practice. You find some cracks, you fill them with tar, and you leave it until the next year, and you put the road on a replacement um, timeline. But Mr. Kreiner had suggested the liquid road, something the council trusted his judgment on. The road was laid. I drove over it uh, quite a few times this past weekend to test it out, look at it, see how it drove. I actually talked to residents in the neighborhood to see how they felt about it. And um, it, it really has um, received some accolades from not only the DPW who, who put the road down, but also uh, the residents at least that I spoke to. Uh, did have a good reaction to it. So this is something we'll continue to monitor and see how this goes. But a very, very, very much a cost-saving measure. 
Uh, in our budget this year, we were able to, um, you know, going back maybe to 2008 for a moment when the economy started to hit the skids, what started to happen is that our departments were not able to uh, replace equipment on an annual basis. And money got extraordinarily tight, revenue got tight, expenditures either stayed the same or went up, putting our departments in a position where they were holding on to equipment longer than they had in the past. We have discussed this with every department, our, our public safety, which includes, of course, our fire and our police department, our DPW, our water department, and wastewater uh, department, as, as well as our golf course. And uh, the administrators for each of those departments have now put uh, back into rotation these vehicles. So we are going to be able to start to have a, a, a rotation for vehicle replacement that we weren't able to do the past few years. But this is, this is really the first time we've been able to do that in quite some time. So this year we were able to purchase a new 4x4 four four, uh, Dodge pickup. We were able to purchase the, uh, it's a K621 4x4 four four front end and loader. That's not actually it. I think that is a picture of one just like it. Uh, but we also bought a uh, Xmark Zero Turn cutter. So again, we're starting to replace some of the tired equipment before it reaches the point that it's not worth anything. So we're able to trade these in or sell these at auction, get some of the money back and put it towards the purchase of these. One of the things that happened this year, um, towards the end of the summer, you may have, if you were paying attention at the council meetings, heard this part of this discussion was uh, our water levels are extremely high along the St. Clair River and this was causing a problem with our shoreline where we were seeing some of the picture on the right, seeing some of our uh, shoreline and, and the rocks and the base that we used to hold that shoreline together um, start to fall. And that was because of the increased size of the waves and the increased size of the, I'm sorry, the increased uh, height of the water. So our DPW I uh, went down and over the course of uh, days or maybe uh, a week or two, rebuilt that entire shoreline. Again, that's not something that we had to send anybody uh, out to do. Our DPW did that in-house. does bring us to our Department of Public Safety. Sometimes uh, you measure a department by its statistics, and I don't know that you can necessarily do that with the Marysville Police and Fire Departments, but here are some statistics nonetheless. Uh, crime statistics, uh, arrests were up 16 percent. We had 208 arrests as opposed to 179 in 2014. Crime incidents rose slightly, 3 percent, that's 515 as compared to 497. We did have uh, Sergeant Raker retire this year. We have hired two patrolmen. Uh, again, um, we were getting thin on um, staffing in the Marysville Police Department and we were able to hire, not only replace Sergeant Raker, but hire an additional patrolman this year. Going back to what I spoke with you about just a few moments ago, uh, we are now able and in a, at a point where we can start our um, police units on a rotation. So we're placing one patrol car each year over the course of three years with a Chevy Tahoe. And you may have seen the Tahoe going around uh, the streets of Marysville, it's black. Uh, the new one is black anyway, and um, odds are, are pretty good that, the, uh, that all of our police units or cruisers will eventually be replaced with Tahoes over the course of years. Um, they were found to be uh, incredible uh, vehicles, they have a little bit more room. The vehicles that we were coming out of, the Chargers, our officers were extraordinarily cramped in there, actually to the point where uh, it really kind of created a danger to them. Uh, because of all the equipment that they house with that. So the Tahoes provide uh, a little bit more room and are speed rated for pursuit. We were also able to purchase a uh, speed trailer. Um, this is another um, purchase by the city that maybe took a little bit of convincing, but again, we look to our department heads. We have an ex extraordinary amount of faith in our department heads. And here we had uh, Chief Koenig and Assistant Chief Buckmaster who run a great department advise us that um, the purchase of a speed trailer could do a couple of different things. One, it would give us uh, an indication as to how roads were being traveled in the city and at what time. So if there were specific complaints as to speed violations in the city, we could place the trailer out there and it would allocate not only the speeds but the times of day that those speeds were being met, the heaviest, heaviest trafficked times of the day. So if we had residents on River Road that were complaining about speed and we didn't know what, what time that speed was going to be, we could set the trailer out there 
uh, for a couple of weeks, take a measure of when we saw the highest speeds, and then we could send a patrol unit out to, to uh, guard those streets at that time rather than having sit out there for three or four hours at a time hoping to catch a speeder and, and, lower, and lower the speed traffic on those roads. So um, uh, we used to borrow one from the county sheriff's department. Now we have our own. The other thing we've, we are getting is a new fingerprint scanner. This is a countywide grant, and uh, that's, again, something that we just talked about, I believe, during the last meeting. Our fire truck, uh, our fire truck, our ladder truck uh, was refurbished, refurbished this year. Um, the cost of that, I believe, was about a half a million dollars. Don't quote me on that, but I believe it was right in that neighborhood as compared to the purchase of a new ladder truck, which I believe is about 1.5 to 1.8. Again, those are soft numbers. Don't quote me exactly, but there was a substantial savings. We were also, and this is after refurbishing uh, one of our ambulance rigs uh, a year or two ago, we found that the product that we received back was a good product. It met all of our needs. It was a huge cost savings. So we sent our ladder truck down to Florida uh, to be refurbished. We got that back, and it was in the uh, most recent Homecoming Day parade, uh, looking all new and shiny. <coughs> Uh, we did have a 7% a, a decrease in calls from 2014 to 2015. Numbers are still staggeringly high, um, 1,628 in 2015 um, from September 2014 to, to the present, as compared to 1,750 the previous year. Um, that's still an extraordinary high number of calls for our fire department. One of the things uh, that this council has been very, very active on is community development. Um, I think that it's very fair to state that when this council was sat uh, two years ago, one of the messages that we wanted to send very loud and very clear is that Marysville is open for business. Uh, we formed the Marysville Business Council uh, immediately. It was one of my first discussions with Randy, uh, who was acting city manager at the time. Um, I immediately formed a Marysville Business Council, and um, Council Member Hendricks has chaired that council. That council has had extraordinary success in getting down really to the grassroots level of our businesses. What we wanted to determine was, um, are the businesses' needs of our community being met by the city, or are there hindrances that the city uh, places uh, that prohibit growth or prohibit new business? Um, this, this past year, we were able to welcome Dollar General in a new building on Gratiot. Harsons Island Brewery opened. Uh, I believe that the owners of Harsons Island Brewery, Brewery spent about or invested about a million dollars in that building. That's the old hostess building. Um, it has had a grand opening, I believe, in August and a couple of ribbon cuttings thereafter. Uh, but really, you know, you take a look at a business like that, and they could have opened their doors anywhere. Uh, they really could have. They could have opened in St. Clair or Moraine City. Their family is from Harsons Island. They could have opened in Port Huron. They could have opened down in Macomb County, but they specifically chose the city of Marysville, and we want to thank them for that. And we wish them extraordinary success. The Tractor Supply Company, we just did a ribbon cutting at the Tractor Supply Company um, on October 9th, um, and they were delighted to be here. And, and you know, going out and speaking with the, the owners of these businesses is a great experience because, you know, being mayor, I may meet with the owners a couple of times and, uh, you know, sometimes not at all, but, you know, kind of get a feel for them and who they are and what they want to do and, and indicate, you know, uh, we're going to help you in any way we can. And we have those meetings, and Mr. Fernandez and I have those meetings. But... <coughs> When I met uh, the gentleman who is the uh, manager of the tractor supply company, he said, you have no idea what it's like to do business in the city of Marysville. Sean Quain, mentioned by name, who was our inspector here, he said, anytime I called him, he was there. Anytime I needed from the city, the city was there. Anything that we needed, the city got us. And, you know, we need that type of message to be sent out because Gratiot could use some more businesses, and that's what we're trying to pull in. We're trying to pull the business community together, not only our existing businesses, but the businesses that are thinking about relocating, the businesses that are thinking about opening their door somewhere. We want that message that, uh, that the manager from TSC gave me, that it's, it was just a delight to work with the city of Marysville and getting our doors open. We want that message really uh, sounded off. We want that labeled loud and clear that Marysville is open for business. <coughs> SMR Automotive is another one. It is one of the county's largest 
employers and certainly the city of Marysville's largest employer. And it seems like every time I turn around, I'm getting an email or a phone call from the executives at SMR indicating that they're ready to expand or that they're ready to hire again. And uh, we did a ribbon cutting on a paint plant, and there'll be uh, another ribbon cutting uh, coming up in the not too distant future. They're looking to go over 1,000 employees in the year 2016. Um, just hu and, and again, going back a few years, that was a, that was a plant that could have gone down to Mexico. That was a plant that could have shuttered its doors. Uh, gone down to Tennessee, but Sai uh, uh, Tatiani and uh, his crew fought hard to keep that business open in the city of Marysville, and they succeeded. Not only did they succeed in, in keeping the business open here, they succeeded in expanding it. So now that SMR plant is truly vested in this region, and really does. I, I believe that uh, I believe that it's about a 76 percent somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, the people that are employed in that plant are Sinclair County residents, so again, that's important. And then we had Ellery Machinery. Uh, Mr. Ellery, uh, I believe, was born and raised in St. Clair, had a machine shop up in the Lexington area, and wanted to relocate to the city of Marysville specifically. And we worked with Mr. Ellery uh, some very long hours. I know Mr. Fernandez put in a lot of hours. I know I had a lot of meetings with Mr. Ellery in just trying to determine what it is can, that we can do for you to get your business here. And, uh, and now I get, and I see on Facebook too, he posts his updates of what he's been able to do in his machine shop. Um, building permits really kind of remain steady. There were uh, 123 in 2014, 121 in 2015. Building permit revenue was up 120%, meaning uh, bigger types of permits are being pulled. Our revenue in 2014 was 60,000. Our, our revenue in 2015 was 133. It's important to note there was no increase in fees. Um, we did not increase the fee structure of our permit, um, but it reflects the value of commercial and industrial development. Uh, there were four new single family homes built, uh, which is great. And uh, we are going to be moving uh, in the not too distant future. I would expect by the end of this calendar year, our department, uh, our building department will be moved to the DPW and out of City Hall. Now you've heard, um, you've heard a lot about recreation in the City of Marysville and up on the display is a proposal for a municipal campus. And this really would uh, incorporate not only a City Hall but also a new recreation center in, a, in, a, in place for our uh, museum ar artifacts. Um, I've indicated that I won't spend a lot of time on this. I did give a, a very thorough presentation and there's also some presentations on the web that I gave uh, that you can tune into but on November 3rd there will be an advisory vote and the question really is whether or not the city should uh, continue to look into this with the community support or should it not. Um, by voting yes on the advisory vote it doesn't mean that you believe that we should build this what it means is that you agree that we should further look into this and I think that that is a message that needs to be clearly sent. What I would indicate is that uh, if there is a um, majority of people, of our residents, that vote yes, this will uh, be a matter that is very thoroughly dissected and vetted by city council and city administration. Right now, the building that you're in, I be believe, was built in 1966. It's approximately 14,000 square feet. It used to house uh, Marysville Public Schools upstairs. We have approximately 7,000 <coughs> square feet of unused space upstairs. Our rec department is run out of the uh, former fire hall in the park. I believe, I believe it was built in 1933. Uh, quite truthfully and honestly, I can tell you it's really nothing more than a glorified garage. Uh, it has a very poor HVAC system. It really has no air conditioning. If a member of this community wanted to uh, host a birthday party for their son, their daughter, or their grandma, or wanted to host a baby shower and you wanted to rent out space that this city has available to rent, you rent out the garage of the old uh, fire hall. I would encourage you uh, maybe to make an appointment if you have any interest in seeing it with Stephanie Denarden or another member of our administration to see exactly what it is that we're talking about. But when we were going through our budget sessions, we were asked to spend $50,000 on an HVAC system for the um, recreation center, the old fire hall. And I think we all uh, sitting at the table, all council members began to scratch their head and, and ask the question, at what point do we stop kicking the can down the road? And that time might be now. Uh, we believe that we could build a municipal center uh, to house not only our um, 
City Hall and our Recreation Center, but our museum artifacts, as well as uh, a gymnasium, a field house for indoor uh, sports use all year round, classrooms for the recreation department, a community room that can be rented out. And, and this is not the design that would have to be built, but this is an artist's rendition similar to what a lot of you are here to see with regard to the DTE plant. This is something that could happen. This is an idea that is in place. There's two reasons that you see this in front of you. The first is we went to an advisory vote because we know what happened back in 1996 and there isn't a single member of council that wanted to take a project of this magnitude um, and really uh, force it upon our residents for lack of a better explanation. In 1996 there was uh, a proposal similar to this. There was an advisory vote at that time. The cost of that recreation center alone was uh, approximately seven million dollars. The advisory vote was uh, not only uh, shot down, but it was shot down by an extraordinarily wide margin. And we felt it important to test the pulse of our community uh, because that's really what we're here to do. We're here to serve you. And we believe that a municipal campus would best serve you, but again, it's nothing that this council wanted to force upon you as a resident. Um, the idea would be that we move City Hall, uh, all the offices in City Hall, our recreation center, and all of our museum artifacts to a new building that would house all of that. We would have a gym that would be run by the city rec and available for city rec and we'd have an indoor field house that could be used 365 days a year for all indoor sports. Uh, the further part of that plan would be that we sell the land that City Hall is on right now. Uh, at last count we had four potential buyers for City Hall and that's before it's up for sale. Um, but again, it's something that, uh, that I, I did a presentation on. It's something that I've done some, um, a, a video on that is out on the internet that I would encourage you to watch because I think it answers a lot of questions. But this is something that our recreation department and our uh, city hall feel uh, strong that uh, we really are gonna ask our residents to put, um, put, put some discussion into and, and, and on November 3rd, uh, really vote your conscience. And that really is uh, just asking you whether or not we should continue to look into building a new municipal campus. Further hitting on recreation, we had uh, sponsorships totaling $14,000. We hired 37 seasonal employees and we issued 15 SCORE scholarships to Marysville residents. These are some of the recreation, recreational activities that we have in the city. We had the daddy-daughter dance, we had 250 people in attendance, we had 80 people at our Easter egg hunt. We had 120 uh, attendants, attendees at our canine 5K, and I don't know if that's people and dogs or just people, but there were 120 there. I don't think they measured by feet. Uh, we had six concerts in the park, and I, I understand those were very well attended. We had 75 kids at Tent City, which was a huge success this year. And we had 150 people at our sunset run. Um, and we had our Christmas parade last year. I believe it was cold. I don't know if anybody, but it was cold, and we had... Uh, very appropriately, I think we had Elsa and Olaf from um, oh, that Disney movie, Frozen, thank you, from Frozen. This year we're going to have uh, Minions and Ninja Turtles, so uh, we're asking everybody to come out for that. It's a good community project. It's nice to see the community behind that. So in furtherance of recreation, we are in phase two uh, of Chrysler Beach. If you have been down there lately, uh, you may have seen the construction beginning on a fish cleaning station. Uh, new bathrooms, a concession stand that will be open in, of course, the summer months, uh, selling, you know, very small candy and pop and things like that for people attending the beach. You're going to see new picnic tables and benches. We've put, uh, I believe, just under $50,000 in LED lights down there. Um, you're going to have playground uh, equipment being installed shortly because the target finish date for this entire project is November of 2015. I believe the actual date is November 15th of 2015. One of the other things we did this year was, uh, you know, we Cuddle Creek was something that we'll get to in a moment, but we've really taken a look at our waterfront this year. And tying that into recreation, we felt the next logical step just to look at, just to see what can be done to enhance the lives of our residents and others, is a review of Marysville Park. Uh, we did a 
review. Uh, this is a conceptual drawing of what the park may look like. Um, you know, broken down into all its phases, I think the totality uh, or the total of the amount uh, of the phases uh, to complete each phase as it stood was about $3.7 million. Um, I don't foresee us moving uh, quickly in a direction to spend $3.7 million on our park. I don't see that in the immediate future. But what I can see is that, uh, you know, we held a few open houses. We got the pulse of the community on that. We asked what the community wanted. We asked what the community needed. And uh, we took that. We implemented it into uh, this conceptual drawing. Uh, I can indicate that uh, Enbridge uh, has donated the property on the corner of Huron and Busha Highway. Uh, which is uh, just across the tracks from you know the proper piece of, of Marysville Park to the city of Marysville for a dog park. So we'll have a dog park coming uh, in the not too distant future. Um, some things we looked at in the, uh, the park itself was the traffic flow, uh, the baseball diamonds, recreational activities uh, for adults and, uh, and children alike. And you'll notice in this drawing down here, this conceptual drawing does not have um, the fire hall, the little bank building, or the original uh, city hall. Those are all raised in this building. That doesn't mean that they have to be raised. Uh, if the advisory vote goes through or you move forward on a municipal campus, I will indicate that uh, it would certainly, uh, I think, be advisable to tear down the fire hall and tear down the bank building. I know that there is a lot of sentiment towards the um, old uh, city hall. And I can understand that, and that's something that can certainly be up for further discussions. But this is just uh, kind of an overview of what we were shown. And we've had a lot of discussions on this. This has gone before not only the Recreation Board, but the Planning Commission. And uh, it, was, it was brought before City Council in one of our uh, goal-setting sessions as well. So over the course of the next couple of years, I can guarantee that this will continue to be a topic of discussion. Bringing us to the Marysville Golf Course, I think that uh, there isn't a member on Council that has asked about the Marysville, Marysville Golf Course. And what we felt was really important to give the golf course a fighting chance was twofold. First was food, and second was uh, alcohol. And we found that to be important because we have, this is a business, and we have to run it like a business, and we have to be able to compete as a business as well. So uh, this year we were able to, after uh, about a year, finally obtain a Class C liquor license that was issued in April. And I'll get to the statistics on that in just a moment. We were approached by uh, the owners of what was to become the Crossfire Grill. And originally this was um, a, a business that was going to be set up temporarily, torn down in the fall. Um, they were going to sell um, you know, some hot dogs and some hamburgers and some ribs and some brisket. But the Crossfire Grill was very, very successful this year. Uh, to the point where uh, the building will remain standing throughout the course of the winter because we can't wait for them uh, to, and I don't know, they may, they may maintain that building uh, deep into the fall. I don't, I don't even know if we have a projected close date for them, but um, that is something that I think is going to be a fixture. They were very popular. Uh, they served a lot of good food down there. And it wasn't only for the golfers. What they found is that uh, a lot of the local factories, the SMRs, the ZFs, the Chryslers, were going down there for lunch as well, which... Uh, really benefited them. But what this really did allow us to do was compete with all of the other golf courses in the area, allowed us to, to be part of the game and part of the discussion. When somebody's going to have an outing, um, you know, being able to buy beer on the course is generally pretty important, as is food. And now we're able to provide both of those things right here uh, on our municipal golf course. Um, there were 246 season passes purchased, 246 passes. <laughs> Let me try that one more time. 246 passes purchased this year. That's up 24 from 2014. Uh, 56 new pass holders largely due to a referral campaign. And, and this is, again, outside the box thinking by Brian Lentz, our golf course superintendent. Um, if you have gotten the gist of what I've been saying, I think this council has uh, really asked our department heads to think deeply about what's going to make your department better and more economically feasible. Uh, in the next budget session. And Brian Lentz started thinking outside the box and I want to commend him for that because what he came up with was a referral campaign. We were able to generate 56 new pass holders and that probably would not have happened. Again, we're talking about the vi viability uh, of our golf course and bringing in 50 new passes uh, this year was, was a very good effort and I'd like to commend Brian on that. Um, 
talking about pure numbers, uh, our greens fee and cart revenue was up 4.7% from last year to date. There was no increase in greens fees or carts, which means that you've got more people playing the same course. Total course revenue is up 18.5% when you add in liquor sales. Our revenue on liquor sales was $48,000. We spent just under 24, making our net revenue uh, $24,000. So, you know, you can look at, um, you know, these statistics down here, but uh, talking just golf carts, uh, we've got a net revenue as of 1015 of uh, 2015 of $73,000. Uh, and that's just a golf cart rental. And I believe the golf carts are set to be renewed uh, next year. Our lease is up. We are getting, again, electric carts. They're going to be, uh, I believe, a little bit cheaper, uh, but I think we're going to get 10 more, so it may cost us a little bit more. What we found is that sometimes when we have events at the golf course, we have to go and we have to rent golf courts to house all the people that are coming in, and sometimes we're just out of carts. So I think what you're going to see is I think we have 50 right now, and we're going to go up to 60, I think, is the number. Again, don't quote me on that, but it's in the ballpark. All right, talking about our projects and our grant money, we received a grant from MDOT. This is the $237,000 for a bike path. I will indicate that Council Member Rita Hendricks was, uh, was a major, major contributor to getting this grant. She spearheaded this along, of course, with our... Um, City Manager Randy Fernandez, but $237,000 for the MDOT bike path for fiscal year uh, 16. Um, the MDEQ gave Cuddle Creek Golf Course uh, another grant, so the, the total grants for Cuddle Creek Project um, near about $2.6 million. This $241,000 is for an irrigation pump and pump house. We'll be dr directly pumping water out of the St. Clair River to irrigate the course. Uh, that's something that the city of Marysville might have otherwise had to undertake to the cost of almost a quarter million dollars. But uh, that was, again, a grant that we were given. There was no match to that, uh, to the very best of my knowledge. And $247,000 has uh, gone to a new irrigation pump and pump house. Um, because of the expansion of SMR, MDOT uh, did award a grant of $90,000 for improvements on 18th Street. And this is essentially for, I believe, deceleration and acceleration lanes and turn lanes uh, in that area. Uh, we also received $3,000 for our police officers for the Bulletproof Vest Partnership Program. Our total grant dollars were over half a million dollars this year alone. Uh, kind of on a side note, we'll be receiving three to four body cameras. This is something that you've seen a lot in the news uh, from the Urban Security Area Initiative, and this is a countywide grant. Cuddle Creek Restoration is nearing its completion. I just talked about the new irrigation in the pump house. Uh, construction on that began this month. All major construction uh, completed within the golf course boundaries. The seating is complete through hole 18. Um, they've begun to mow number 18 fairway and uh, trees and shrub planting is beginning in October. There's just some pictures. This is the um, this is uh, the construction of the bridge that goes over the, uh, the Cuddle Creek. Uh, this is the uh, 18th fairway up here and then the, the green would be off the picture to the right. This is the setting of the bridge and then this is the, the project when it was near completion. Again, just some more pictures. You know, there's a lot of pictures in the Cuddle Creek because this is something that uh, we have been working on as a city for years, and this is really the culmination of that. But this is the 18th fairway before the construction was complete, and now really kind of what it looks like with construction complete in that same area. Again, before and after. These are the boards and commissions we have. We have the Pension Board, Recreation Board, we have the Planning Commission, we have the Business Council, which I talked about earlier, we have the SEMCOG Transportation Committee. We're also part, um, uh, a few of us, of the St. Clair County Blue Meets Green Leadership Council. Mr. Fernandez and I uh, are part of that council, and that really is a, a meeting of the majority of the stakeholders in the Blue Water area. Um, we're also part of the St. Clair County Transportation Study. Uh, the EDA, uh, Mr. Fernandez sits on the executive board, and we are part of the Discover the Blue campaign, something that I'm sure you've heard a lot about, but that is something that is trying to get 
uh, all of the stakeholders of this area invested in, in attracting <coughs> new talent and people to this area. Noteworthy events of, la of the past year, uh, we were able to establish a community endowment fund um, this year. Uh, really, Randy Myers and, and Ron Chris uh, were, were instrumental in that, and the Community Foundation is Neister. We had SMR expansion that I spoke of earlier in job growth. There's 94,000 new square feet, 814 employees now that will go over 1,000 uh, in the calendar year 2016. ZF Job Growth, they hired 68 employees over the past year. Not all news is good news. Flint Hills Resources did close. There were 76 jobs lost. This will be a big hit to our uh, water department. They consumed a lot of water. Mr. Rubel uh, will advise us of that coming up. Market Square, uh, that is a, a, an area that has sat vacant for years and really untouched. And uh, Mr. Fernandez and I had a lot of meetings with the prior owner asking him, how can the city help you move this along? How can we fill this up? Ultimately, we were uh, able to help facilitate a sale of that property. And, um, and we hope to see some uh, economic uprising in the Market Square. We have, uh, we're very pleased to have on our council the Blue Water Civic Woman of the Year, Council Member Rita Hendricks. And uh, there's a picture of Rita. And we also have uh, an award to uh, our city manager, Randall Fernandez, from the Hispanic Commission of Michigan for being the first um, uh, uh, Hispanic city manager in the state of Michigan. So what can you see for the next coming year? And, and, and it was kind of neat because I went back and I looked at um, what I said last year during this time, what to expect in the next year. And everything that, that was on that presentation, I've discussed this evening as something that's either been fulfilled or something that we're continuing to work on. So it's nice to see the progress on that. Municipal campus, it's either going to move forward with vetting that and determining whether or not that's the right thing for the community, or it won't. But that uh, vote will happen on November 3rd. The dog park is something that I think will move forward in the next uh, year. Former Viking Lanes. The Viking Lanes property has been tied up in court for years. That is becoming untangled and untied. And uh, in the next year, I am fairly certain, or well, let's keep it at fairly certain, fairly certain that you will see some redevelopment there. Um, what a majority of you are here to hear about, the former DTE site redevelopment is also something uh, that you will start to see in the next year. Market Square redevelopment, we talked about that. More road improvements, Marysville City Park updates, tracking of personal property tax reform. As you may have heard in the news, uh, the legislature uh, is, is considering or determining how they are going to eradicate and then reallocate the personal property tax. We will stay tuned on that because it obviously uh, does have a p an impact on our revenue and expenditures. The last thing here uh, I want to point out is employee recognition. Marysville, uh, I can honestly tell you, I think boasts <laughs> some of the greatest employees, if not only in the state, not only in the state, but in the country. We have a dedicated police and fire department. We have a dedicated water and wastewater department. We have a dedicated department of public works. We have a dedicated golf course. These employees work tirelessly. And it's uh, often I get an email uh, about how one department worked with another, where they were working overtime, or, or they went out of their way. I got an email from Mr. Rubel about how the DPW and the water department worked together in, in this muddy hole for hours and hours and hours on end because the job needed to get done. I got an email, email about how uh, Assistant Chief Buckmaster uh, had found out that uh, one of our residents had flags stolen and uh, was an elderly member of this community and on his own volition out of his own pocket he went and he had uh, he went and bought flags and gave them to that resident. You know that isn't those things don't happen in a vacuum those things happen in the city of Marysville so what we are going to do this year is we're going to do employee recognition. Every month at a city council meeting, we'll be recognizing employee of the month. We'll also have an employee recognition dinner uh, coming in the winter months. I don't know if it's going to be January, February, March, somewhere in there. The details have not been uh, put to paper, but we believe it's important to recognize the everyday contributions of our employees that make this city excellent. Now, 
the former DTE site. Everybody's sitting up in their chairs again. <laughs> not a day goes by, and I mean this honestly, there is not a day that has gone by in probably the last year and a half, okay, we'll say the last year. There's not a day that has gone by in the last year that I have not been asked at least once, or maybe twice, two questions. One, when is the DTE plant coming down? And the second, what are you going to do there? Great questions. And that's because the DTE plant has been an integral part of this community since 1922. There isn't a member or an audience member in this room or anybody watching at home that can't go through their family tree and figure out that somebody worked there. That the DTE plant put bread on the table for a family, whether it was an uncle, a dad, or a cousin. You look at what is left there, and it is a constant reminder of what DTE brought to this community, and that was jobs, and that was growth, and that was investment, and that was DTE being an excellent community partner for nearly a hundred years. But like with all good things, sometimes they come to an end, but sometimes when they come to an end, you have better things starting a new beginning. And that's really what we're hoping here. Demolition to the DTE plant will occur in November of 2015. It will not occur in October. We have indicated that there are 17 uh, conditions that must be met in order for the city administration to sign off on the permit order. The city administration and I have had numerous meetings with DTE, with SciTech, who has been hired to raise the building, with CDI who has been hired by SciTech to implode the building, with members of CDC who own the site, one of the representatives is here tonight and I'll introduce him in just a moment, to make sure that everything that is happening and the order in which it's happening is safe for our residents and our community. I've been asked a lot of questions about asbestos. I can tell you that I've learned more about imploding a building in the last year than I would, would have ever guessed. But that's a good thing. It's because SciTech has been open and honest. It's because CDC has been open and honest. It's because CDI has been open and honest. It's because they have sat with us tirelessly and answered all the questions that we've had. And that's, again, something that we wanted to do for you. When we heard the, CD, when we heard the DTE site was to be sold, I think that we all got a little bit nervous. We all got a little bit nervous because it's not property that the city owns, but it is something that really is a part of the city that you can't tear away from. It's, it's nearly 30 acres on the water that is prime for redevelopment. And so when DTE was vetting suitors to take over that property, to buy that property, and to make it their own, they used a process by which they looked back and they realized what an important contribution they themselves had made to this community and DTE found that they wanted to ensure that whoever they sold that to held in their accord the same types of principles that DTE had, founding itself in the city. Ultimately, the DTE site was sold to CDC, and I can tell you that I think the city is truly blessed, and I mean that in every way. The city is blessed to be working with CDC because anybody but a, could have bought it and really developed it in the way they saw fit. But CDC has become a community partner. They have become a line of communication on what our future holds. And they are vested and they are interested. And I do not believe that DTE could have sold that site to, any better, to anybody who would be better suited than CDC. CDC, or Commercial Development Company Incorporated, is headquartered in St. Louis, Missouri. It's a privately held, diversified real estate acquisition and development firm whose principal competency lies within the acquisition, repositioning, and redevelopment of underutilized, distressed, or environment, environmentally challenged properties. CDC's North American acquisition and redevelopment portfolio includes 48 million square feet under roof located on 254 sites throughout 39 states in Canadian provinces, provinces. At this point, I would invite John Fonke 
Executive Vice President of Asset Management of CDC to join me at the podium. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks for having me uh, up here, and uh, it's a pleasure and a privilege to be here. And I must say it's been a, a real joy to work with the, the city officials, the mayor, Mr. Fernandez, uh, and, and a lot of you in the, in the audience, uh, and to get that input and to hear what, what the people really want from that, that site. Uh, as the mayor said, that site has a lot of history, and we recognize that, and we recognize it every day as, as I drive into on Gratiot Boulevard and I see those smokestacks and I think, boy, that, that really is a presence. And, and you see that all along the river. So with that in mind, we, we've uh, engaged the conversations with the city, the city officials. Uh, we've had a consultant come t with us and develop a master plan. We've had meetings with brokers, developers, and other interested parties to see what what we can do to use this property, re redevelop it into the highest and best use, and to be part of the community so that it meets the needs of the community, not just for selfish reasons, for our purposes. Um, based on that, that history and the beautiful location along the St. Clair River, we think we've captured that in a vision. And that vision is something that uh, we're going to share with you tonight. But keep in mind, it's, it's just a, a concept plan. It's not carved in stone. It, it's a concept plan that we want to, to put out there to get people thinking with the idea that this, this can become uh, a destination for not only the city of Marysville, but for the, the entire community. And uh, we think we, we've captured that in this concept plan. And uh, with that, I'm gonna let the mayor kind of take the lead and uh, do your thing. Well, my thing was to make sure that CDC was here for the unveiling because this really is a partnership. John, maybe if you would have the honors of unveiling uh, the, the overview. Ladies and gentlemen, what you see before you is uh, the culmination of a lot of meetings like Mr. Fonke said. Maybe I can help you out here too. What you see before you is a mixed-use destination. It consists of a hotel, a marina, restaurants, retail shops, a fitness center. Really what this is, is this is a community square that would invite members from far outside of our community to join us. Here's some blow-ups. I can, I can. Okay. To elaborate on that a little bit, um, the, the one that he's unveiling currently is, is the kind of the north end of the property, and that is the marina section. And, and uh, keep in mind, these aren't these haven't been engineered or anything. These are high-level plans just for discussion. And with the idea being that that the marina is on the north end, uh, and, and the current pier stays in place. What we do is add a, a hotel. A uh, five-story hotel with residential condominiums on the top, uh, a bathhouse, and, and area for the, uh, the the day slips to be uh, for people to use those. Um, and, and also, we've added Edison Boulevard just to play off of the the concept of, of the BTE plant and, and the history behind that. Uh, the next phase, uh, as you move south, is the amenities building. We'll call that. It's a it's a two-story building um, that that houses, banquet rooms, things like that, that, that overlook the, the river and a river walk. And what that does, it, it allows, uh, it becomes kind of the foundation for some retail shops and some small office components uh, that, that create a, a courtyard. And that courtyard could be used uh, either here or over here for, for street performers, for uh, art galleries, things like that, that, that just create more of a destination for people to come and hang out and just, you know, enjoy all the amenities and, and not only just the, the small retail shops, but then we've incorporated a fitness center and a freestanding outlet that could be used for a restaurant, a higher end restaurant or, you know, a cinema, something like that, just to create that, that vibrant feel to, to the area so that people really want to come here and spend the day, spend the afternoon, and um, whether they come by water, 
uh, or are staying at the hotel, but, but it becomes an all-inclusive campus, if you will, for, for a destination. And that's really what we feel would be the highest and best use at this point. And I think part of the vision incorporates the desire to have people come into the city and stay. Uh, the hotel concept, uh, as discussed and, and really kind of developed, is, 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 is more of a suite type of hotel where people will come and they're going to want to stay maybe not just one night, but they're going to make a, a destination out of it. It has really uh, a beautiful view of the water. But imagine a place where you could come and you could dock your boat and you could stay in a hotel, a nice hotel if you so chose, and you could have uh, meals on site at two or three different restaurants over the course of two or three days and boutique type of shopping. And you could have a walkable waterfront with uh, fountains and with fire pits that make you want to be there, that make you want to be a part of this place. And that really is, uh, I think, part and parcel. If you look at some of these renditions, it, it would remind you maybe of a Savannah, Georgia waterfront or a Key West type of square, but it, it, it acknowledges uh, the waterfront. It acknowledges that this is a place that people will want to be. Marysville has no place to dock a boat. There are no day slip marinas available. Um, once this plan started to be discussed, what I would say discreetly, I was contacted by uh, a, a local marina operator and said, you know, the city of Marysville CDC, you guys are right on target. This is exactly what your area needs. Um, we have reached out to some, what I might call restaurants with local flair, restaurants that every one of you would know um, and every one of you would travel to within about an hour's drive to, be, to determine whether or not they want to be a part of this. And there's already interest in that. So, uh, you know, I, I can tell you as, uh, as mayor of the city of Marysville, I look very forward to, continue to continuing to work with CDC, with Mr. Fonke, with Mr. Jostis, and uh, with their entire executive crew uh, to bring the new DTE site to the city of Marysville. Anything left? No, I'd just like to, again, thank, thank you all for having us and being so welcoming, and uh, the city officials have been more than open uh, to discuss these things with us and create the ideas for us uh, and, and give us the direction and, and you know shared with us the history and the strong community support uh, and, and that that goes a long way it makes our job a little easier to to understand what what you all are looking for and what what would make sense to be the the highest and best use for this facility and, and I think I think we've captured that or at least we're on the right track thank you with that, I would like to thank each and every one of you who came out to attend this or anybody who's watching at home. Thank you for your interest in the City of Marysville. Thank you for your interest in what we have going on. And on behalf of City Council and City Administration, I'll indicate that we look forward to continuing to serve you.